So this was um, this was actually relevant to something that I read yesterday. Chapter two, and by the way, this is the dissertation. Okay, we're not talking about we're not talking about this book here. We're talking dissertation now. Chapter two, traditional free choice, Christian authors of ninety five two fifteen CE. Now, this is a single chapter. I mean, how many? Um, Okay, so it is just over 20 pages long, grand total, covering 120 years. So you have Clement, Shepherd of Hermas, Didache, Polycarp, Ignatius. Why would you have... That's weird. Okay, so the entire, all the Apostolic Fathers are covered in one, two, three and a half pages. I could come up with a whole lot more in the Apostolic Fathers, something like that, but this is a survey of 120 years worth. Now, there's, it's not like there's a huge amount of writing here, but, you know, we talked about Clement yesterday and his one epistle, from the patristic sources and stuff like that. I'm, and I've been doing some. Um, speaking of, so that to be saved by mercy and good conscience, the number of his elect, the number, Arithmon, from which we get arithmetic, Arithmon, the number of his elect. Now, who speaks of the number of the elect? Well, Reformed people do. Don't go with the Manichaeans. This was written before Manny was born. Okay? Can't go there. Um, and you don't have an elect amongst the Stoics. Because you don't have a God who would make a choice. Um, and if you want to try to come up with some type... Because there was a specific term, elect amongst the Manichaeans. But it obviously has a completely different referent and understanding the background to this is going to be Paul. It's going to be Romans. It's going to be who will bring a charge against God's elect. All right. So what's the number? And let me just ask a simple question. If you are surveying patristic sources as to their understanding of the relationship of God's decree and will and man's will and the freedom or whatever of that will, shouldn't you at least note that Clement seemed to believe that there was a specific number of the elect? Because if the elect is just a group that we fill up by our choices, then, which is what the quote-unquote traditionalist and reading, even using that term and reading it back into patristics is just horrible. But this clearly is based upon the idea that there is a number. And it's, it's, it's not saying so that that number can be increased. There is a fixed number that is being saved and that's what the reference is to. Wouldn't that be relevant to this? There's, there's only three paragraphs about First Clement, and one paragraph is a Greek citation from Clement. So there's, there's only two sections. Why isn't this included? Or all the other references to the elect? And then, just looking at it, and I... I, I just happened to turn the page and saw this, and I went, let's just go ahead and read this. Okay, We're, we've got enough time. We've got a couple more minutes before it's over. Page 42. The Didache, Polycarp, and Ignatius. The Didache and Polycarp are, uh, are non-contributory. So, what the Didache says, and, of course, Polycarp, which... I don't have time to do this, but if someone's like really bored in isolation, you are in a leftist state and like 
you can't even look out your window without getting reported by the old lady across the street if you're not wearing a mask inside and gloves. Um, and you've got time to do it. Somewhere in the back of my mind, either during the debate or du- during that interview, Leighton Flowers mentioned Polycarp. He mentioned Polycarp. But according to this, Polycarp's non-contributory. Can't tell us anything about it. Um, so, in other words, here you have some of our earliest sources. They don't tell us anything about what people believe at this point in time. For Ignatius, circa 110 CE, each person bears either a stamp of God or the world. From Magnesians 5. The charactera, character, could possibly be interpreted as God's unilateral mark upon the faithful elect versus unbelievers, but his emphasis upon voluntary martyrdom suggests otherwise. Why? Why? Do you see that there's, there's a, there's a, there are assumptions working here? The assumption is, if you can make the voluntary cho- choice for martyrdom, then you can't believe in God's unilateral mark upon the faithful elect. Why? Ignatius implies we possess a free choice that enables us to choose to suffer death with Christ resulting in life, or alternatively clinging to life with death resulting. Persons decide between the two ways. Do do you see a system in operation here? Do you see a... um, interpretive grid that is being placed in these things. Um, boy, I want to uh, hear. Oh, wow. This is going to, this is going to be fun. And you know, it's going to be fun for all of us. You're sitting there going, Oh no, no, this will be fun for all of us because he does deal with the epistle to Diognetus. Epistle to Diognetus is one of the most important fragments we have. Boy, I wish we had the whole thing. Really do. But it's sometimes called Mathetes because he calls himself a disciple. It's just a word for disciple. We don't have the name of the writer. You don't know who wrote it. Um, but it has a tremendous section on a thoroughly Pauline and biblical presentation of the gospel. And so I want to You see, when we dig into stuff like this, even if you are not particularly focused upon dealing with this theory that's being promoted that all Calvinists are actually secret secret Manichaeans. um, What? What was that? Oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) Okay, thank you. Um, Even if you're not necessarily into, (laughs) into all of that, the fact is we are delving into we are getting deeper into church history than you get in the vast majority vast majority of seminary church history classes unless you're specializing in history you don't believe me there's a tremendous series of church history classes from covenant seminary from one of the old professors there i've listened to it three or four times um on the old itunes university i don't know where that is anymore but you can still find them go listen and tell me if we are not going much more in depth, far more citations, uh, far more of the theology than you would get, and that would be a considered a uh, standard, fulfilling the requirements for a master's degree in seminary type stuff. We have to, given the nature of the claims that are being made. But what's vital is that's important in dealing with Roman Catholicism. That's important in dealing with Islam. That's important in dealing with oneness Pentecostalism. Because remember, I'm repeating myself, but people always ask me, what are the two classes you took that were most important to you? Greek? Church history. Why? Because church history is so liable to be twisted and abused and misused. And we are in a bad place to respond if we don't know who these people were, when they wrote, what they believed, 
And especially if we don't allow them to be who they were, simply to be who they were, not to force them into the service of some modern controversy.